Right now, in this moment in time, I hate the players, I hate the manager, I hate everything to do with Nottingham Forest because I'm just sick to death of performances like this. This is going to be a rant. Good morning, good evening or good night. I hope you guys are doing well and welcome to my post-match thoughts on Forest 1, Palace 1. In which it was just a complete and utter dire, dire game. And again, sick to the back teeth of Forest being unable to play football. Be it under Cooper, be it under Nuno, be it whatever. But these players... I am not going to allow them to get away scot-free with the crap they are producing on the pitch. The lifeless performances on the pitch, man. You literally could put 11 corpses out there and they would show more desire and more passion than the crap we see at the moment on the pitch, at the city ground or even away from home. Please take a second, hit that like button. You guys have been smashing those like targets. So let's set a high one today. Let's go for 522 likes on the video. Subscribe to Forest Fan TV if you are new. And the one slight ray of sunshine was Rayner in that match, I thought. And if you want to get his signed frame shirt, you've only got until tomorrow. There's a few tickets left, so go grab them now. The link's pinned in the comments down below. Okay, let's get into this. Before I just kick off at the players, I'm going to start with Nuno. Now, I'm still behind Nuno. That's like, at the moment, no problems with Nuno in charge. But I it, that does not make him above criticism. And he has a lot that needs to be fired at him. It is too early, in my opinion, to do a Nuno in, Nuno out. I think Nuno has to be there until the end of the season. Unless he starts going L, 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 then we bring that topic up when we do. However, some people are Nuno out. And if you are, more power to you. It's your opinion. Don't let anyone tell you you can't have it. But for me, it's Nuno in. But Nuno is not getting it right. And this is something that like, I had a quick chat with Ant after the match. Well, it was more a WhatsApp chat. There was a lot of capital letters coming from Ant. But something he said really, really hit home with me. He says that he's got to the stage now where he's at his most apprehensive in the waiting for the team sheet. And I just sat there and thought, you know what? Ant talks a lot of crap, but every now and again, a little pearl does come out from his mouth or his texting fingers. And that to me just hit home really hard because it starts to feel how I felt in my first stages under Cooper when I felt my myself turning on Cooper was when you start to become apprehensive about the team sheet and the team selection because you start to lose faith as I did with Cooper that he didn't have a clue how to pick a team what formation to pick etc now with Nuno the formation's right but his selection of players is so far off right now what he did when he first came in was put square pegs in square holes now he's not even putting things that look like pegs into holes anymore and that is just infuriating me. For me yesterday, putting Alanga in a number 10 position, at least I think it was a number 10 position, leaving Origi out wide instead of Alanga playing where he should be playing and then making a mess up of the substitutions and everything else and then leaving Reyna, who's an actual 10, on the bench and putting Alanga on ahead of him, it, it makes complete no sense to me whatsoever. When the team sheet comes out, we saw Sangare and Yates playing together at Luton, and it doesn't work. You can't play a number six with a crapper version of a number six, and you guys decide which way around you want to tag those two players. It didn't work. And then to go and repeat it again, it's another thing that Nuno's almost mirroring from Cooper. Cooper was doing the same things with Worrell in his time because Worrell had the captaincy armband. He feels by default that he had to play him. And Nuno's now got this same dilemma with Yates because Yates is captain. When available, he's putting him in. And that for me is complete and utter stupidity. Now, I'm not saying Sangare play ahead, again, uh, play ahead of Yates. Well, I am. That would be my choice. But I'm saying both of them have been crap as of late. But you don't just default Yates in because he's captain. To me, that's just utter stupidity. 
And the fact that Dominguez wasn't named on that starting 11 when he's the only one who runs around, chases down balls, presses the ball, has a decent pass on him. He's always where the ball is. He just has a knack for that. And Nunes just subbed him. And not even that, it benched him even. He hasn't brought him on at any stage during that game to try and get an element of control. Eze was tearing it up down their left-hand side. We had zero control in that midfield at all. It was one of the worst matches. I'm more annoyed at this match than I was at the Luton match where we conceded a late goal in true typical Forest fashion. But this one annoyed me more because I saw this coming. I said it in the match preview. Forest will do what Forest do best, and that's typical Forest. We'll get a point out of this game. Luckily, Luton just about lost to Spurs. We'll come out the relegation zone, but us as fans have our bank holiday weekend ruined by this crappy team and these crappy players that don't give a damn about how we feel. And Nuna comes out in his press conference after, yeah, we started slow. You said that last week. You said that the week before. You said that the week before that. What are you doing to address this problem? It's all well and good words coming out and saying this crap. And it's just not changing on the pitch. This team is talented enough on paper. Palace were not good yesterday. Take Eze out of it. Take the young kid in midfield out of it. Or I forgot his name now. Wharton or Warburton Bread, whatever he's called. And they were quite bang average in my opinion. And I'm not taking anything away from Palace. I'm talking and focusing on Forest now. If we're not going to be able to beat Luton, if we can't beat Palace at home, what are we going to do against Fulham, man? Every game we've had against them since we've been back in the Premier League, we've lost to them. Most recent game we've beat them was in our promotion season at Craven Cottage um, with Steve Cooper's assist from the throw-in. Do you feel confident come Tuesday that Nuno's going to select the right team for Fulham? Or is this going to be another case of, well, Luton have got Arsenal away. Forrest will eke out an ugly-looking draw against Fulham again. And then we're one point clear now of the safety zone. We're just kicking that can further and further down the road. As things stand, I am more confident in Nick DeMarco gaining Forrest more points on the appeal than I am of the charlatans being able to get us anything on the damn pitch. And that's what's pissing me off the most. The passing in this team is horrific. Only throughout the game did you see the likes of Rayner and Morgan Gibbs-White linking up with passes. The rest of these idiots couldn't pass wind if they tried, let alone a football. Okay, I want to move on to this Sangare agenda that a lot of people seem to have. And also, on top of that, I, I've somehow become the spokesman and the, you know, the chair of the Sangare fan club. Let me make it clear. I couldn't give two monkeys about Sangare. If he doesn't want to stay at Forest, he can do one. If he's not good enough, bench him. I have no problems with that. Do you not think I take a cut of his salary or anything like that? People say, oh, you wanted him in the summer. Actually, Tyler Adams was my first choice. Go back and watch the videos. Sangare was a dream signing. Now, I don't control how well or not Sangare plays football. That's for him, the coaching and the manager to decide. Absolutely nothing to do with me. But what I will not allow is a witch hunt against one player. One player again in a team that is dire. I could single out any single one of those players yesterday, barring Sells the goalkeeper, maybe Callum hudson Adoy, and you could nitpick their performance and you could write a goddamn dossier about how crap they were. But to single out Sangare is a complete agenda. And the agenda is what? He cost us 30 million. So fucking what? I don't care if he cost 100 million. How many flops and big money signings have there been in the Premier League? This one doesn't even touch the sides. And yet, Forest fans seem to think that 30 million is overkill on a player. Look at all the 30 million signings throughout the last two or three years in the Premier League and see how many were successful. It's hit and miss. It happens. But with Sangare, he hasn't become a crap footballer overnight. And that's where I defend him. Because I'll give the examples yet again. Lodi, when everyone turned on him last season, when everyone was saying how crap he was, Chris Wood, people including myself, last season, 
how crap he was. He was deadwood last season, and now suddenly he turns into firewood. This is what it does in a football club. Some players need more time than others. It's that simple. But I am not standing here freaking dying on the hill for Sangare. If Sangare is too crap to play, then drop him. If I had to choose between Sangare and Dominguez, I put Dominguez in the team sheet, first time ahead of Sangare every time. Same thing with Yates. It's funny how Yates, uh, Sangare gets scapegoated, yet I thought Yates was just as crap as Sangare yesterday. They do not work together. And this fault lies on Nuno. Nuno's selecting the wrong balance in that team. He can't seem to get the balance He's got Cooper's same problem. If he goes too defensive, we can't score. If he goes too attacking, we leak. He's got the same problem. And this problem stems from the attitude of these godforsaken charlatan set of players who don't give a crap about this club, this football, or anything at all to do with Forest. So, sell Sangare, sell Yates, sell the whole damn squad. I don't care. Sack Nuno if he's not interested in the job. Bring in someone who is. I do not give a crap what I want to see when players go out, they want to play for this club and they actually play like they damn well care and they play to within their abilities. And from the manager, I want to see players played in their right position in a balanced team, which he was doing at the start and he's completely gone astray from it. Okay, let's move on to, I guess, less ranty topics and... That's about what we saw with Morgan Gibbs White yesterday. I thought he was okay in the first half, but come the second half, he really came to light when he moved back into the eight position for me. And this was one of the teams I suggested in the build-up to the Palace match was to play a Sangare or a Dominguez alongside Morgan Gibbs White and then put Reyna in the 10 position. And for me, as soon as Reyna came on, Morgan Gibbs White's eyes just lit up. Oh, look, an actual footballer who understands what to do with a ball is now present on the pitch with me. Let's have some, you know, interchanges of passes. Let's play a bit of football between us. And shock horror, 30 seconds later after Reyna's introduction, we get a goal. But the real question is, is Morgan Gibbs White an 8 or a 10? Now, in my opinion, I think he can play both. But I do think he's more effective in the 8. Earlier, when uh, Nuno first came in, Morgan Gibbs-White got dropped into the eight for the first game or two, and I thought he looked really good. And it did open up the space to potentially get Reyna in there. Now, what I can say for certain is Alanga is not a 10. Nuno, what the hell were you doing? Anyway, back on to the point. But would I play Morgan Gibbs-White in the eight? I think it's risky. I think it's risky because who do you partner him with? You definitely drop Yates, probably Sangare, and you bring Dominguez in, which seems to be a lot of people's suggestions. So, Dominguez and Morgan Gibbs White almost as a double pivot with Reyna in front of them. My biggest issue with that is you then have a height problem. Morgan Gibbs White is about 5'10, Dominguez is probably shorter than him, and Reyna's not tall either. So any balls aerially or anything we have to do defensively, if you're taking out Yates's height and Sangare's height, <coughs> excuse me then you're going to miss out on that. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we'll start to play more balls on the floor. But I think we become technically more efficient if those three players are playing in that midfield. And you know what? I'm probably going to agree with Crypto and Ant now. We're missing Mangala. We're missing that tenacity in midfield of someone who works really well off the ball. Okay, he's not the greatest on the ball in terms of Mangala, but we are missing that. At least he showed some balls and some passion when it came to playing um, on the pitch but I'm not against this and I'll tell you why because we've had one win this calendar year and the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results so until something changes on the pitch we're gonna see the same crap we've been seeing unless Nuno now has the ability to put a rocket up their anuses nothing is going to change so you're gonna have to tactically change some stuff and maybe we end up getting more control. Morgan Gibbs-White went even deeper. I think he went too deep at some points in that game and was almost playing that quarterback role. My other worry with it is if he ends up that deep, we're going to see Hollywood balls from Morgan Gibbs-White and he doesn't have it in his locker. But it's worth a risk. We have to change something. But Morgan Gibbs-White alongside Dominguez, Reyna in the 10, Callum hudson Adoy on the left, begrudgingly I put Alanga on the right and then Wood up front. And then you just see what happens. 
Start with that. Start from that base point because it's a positive move. And then if it's not working, change it up in the second half. What's, what have we got to lose? Because at the moment, whatever he's doing, and the problem here is when the whole fan base looks at a team sheet and seems to feel they have a better understanding that your selection is wrong, then you are 100% doing something wrong. So try it, see what happens, experiment with it. Maybe we rush out into a two goal lead and then you can switch it around, bring a Sangare in, bring a Danilo in, whatever it might be and bring a bit more sol you know, solidness um, into the team. But Nuno said in his post-match press conference, we need to start better. Well, if we're gonna start better, then we need to start with the ball, with players who can actually pass the ball, who can control the ball and progress us up the pitch. If you're playing in the opponent's half, you're at less risk of conceding in your own half, subject to counterattacks, etc. But you get my sentiment from it. So my problem here now is what happens in a couple of days time when we play Fulham on Tuesday. If we go out with a similar looking team, we're going to get a similar result. Maybe we, you know, scumbag a win out of it. Who knows? But that would paper over the, the cracks there. And that just wouldn't work. So let's make some changes. I'd rather, and I said this under Cooper's reign as well, I'd rather see some kind of positive change in the mentality and the selection, both from the manager and from the players, and lose that game, but have something to build on for the next game. Because I'm coming away from this Palace match thinking, what's next? More of the same old shits. Anyway. We'll wrap it up there for this video. Um, just a quick reminder, if you haven't already, hit that like button. We're looking for 522 plus likes. So check that number down below. If it's below 522, hit that like. It's completely free. Make sure you're subscribed to Forest Fan TV. And I'll leave the link for Rainer's signed framed kit from Football Prizes on the end screen for you, as well as in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on Grumpy Old Reds tonight at the earlier time of 6.30. Come on, you Reds.